The question is this. How do you know that Christ is the only way? Why should I consider becoming a Christian? And so, when I hear, how do you know that Christ is the only way? I, I mean, my, my assumption, what do, what do people mean by that? that? This is a person who's not a Christian. Christ is the only way. How do I know Christ is the only way? The only way to what? I mean, the questions are always the only way to salvation, the only way to God, the only way to heaven, the only way to escape hell, the only way to eternal life. I mean, that's, 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 what, that's what's meant by that. The way, that's, that's what I'm assuming. The only way to God, the only way to survive judgment day. Now, how do we know that Christ is the only way? I mean, the only way without exception. I mean, you know, how many of you have heard the biographical sketch that John Piper did on C.S. Lewis? Nobody's heard that? Has any, have any of you heard any of John Piper's biographical sketches? But you, you've not listened to C.S. Lewis. <clears throat> Lewis had a lot of impact on Piper. So just a few years ago, Piper did a biographical sketch on him. C.S. Lewis, what do we know him for? Chronicles of Narnia, Mere Christianity, Screwtape Letters. We know him for, I mean, he, he wrote a lot of books. Children's books, adults' books. Um, Piper, did a, Piper did this sketch on him and pointed out that he said you might ask you might wonder why I would do this on C.S. Lewis because he had issues with some pretty major doctrines and one of the things like if you've, if you've ever read the Chronicles of Narnia one of the things you recognize in the final volume of that is there's a supposedly this lion, Aslan, is a picture of Christ. But in the end, there's a guy that feels to me like he's Muslim. And Aslan accepts him at the end of this story based on the fact that his worship of his own God was sincere. And I mean, I... I've heard that kind of... That, that is not uncommon among those that are Catholic or with Catholic influence to say that they believe that people will get to heaven as long as they were sincere in their religion. Have you ever heard that? How do we know that Christ is not just a way, but the way? I mean without exception the way. That if you don't go by that way, you don't get there at all. There's nothing about sincerity in other religions. If you don't have Christ, there's no heaven, there's no door to God, there's no eternal life, there's no surviving judgment day. How do we know He is exclusively and with no rival Absolutely the only Savior. How do we know that? He said it. Scripture, now look, Scripture over and over and over again attests to the fact that eternal life is found in Christ. Over and over again it attests to the fact that He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. But I, maybe you've not noticed but there's a whole lot of times that it's not just said in a general way. It is said in a way that there is no missing it. That He is the only way. The only. 
Give me some verses. I mean, again, not one that says eternal life's found in Him. Not one that says He's the Savior. But I want texts that clearly show us He is the only way without exception. And if you don't go by way of Him, there is no other way. John 14.6 Of course, that's, I mean, that's going to be the one I think that's going to come to our minds first. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. And here's where it's exclusive. No one comes to the Father except through Me. You do not get to God any other way. There is no one. There is no one individual that can get to God any other way than by that way, which is Christ. But this is, is, exclusiveness comes to us in a variety of texts. Can anybody think of another one? Acts 4.12. That would probably be the second most common one that would come to people's minds. There is salvation in no one else. It doesn't just say there's salvation in Christ. It says there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name given under heaven. Or name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Can you think of another one? 1 Timothy 2.5 Right, that would be another one right up there. There is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. There's only one. There's not two. There's one. Anybody think of something else? John 10.9. Read that one for us. Are you... Okay, go ahead. Right, I have that one here as well. I am, here's, here's the thing. Not I am a door. I am the door. And I'll tell you what, you look at the Greek, that definite article is present. The door. There's no rival. There's no second door. There's one door. The door. And He's that door. How about this? How about Matthew 11.27? No one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. No one knows the Father. This doesn't have to do with coming to the Father, but this has to do with knowing Him. And isn't that what eternal life is? Eternal life is to know God. No one knows God. No one has eternal life unless the Son gives that. Unless He chooses to reveal the Father. How about this one? Hebrews 10.19 We have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. You say, how's that one exclusive? Because the only way you have confidence to enter the holy places, to enter the realm of God, the immediate presence, manifest presence of God, is by the blood of Jesus. I mean, do you remember? They could only get into the holy of holies with blood. We only get to where God is by the blood. And it says by the blood of Jesus. How about this one? 1 John 5.11 1 John 5.11 says this, This is the testimony that God gave us eternal life and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. That's exclusive. You have life one way if you have the Son. There's no other way. Not if you have Allah. Nothing about Muhammad there. There's nothing about the millions of the Hindu gods there. There's nothing 
about Ganesh. There's nothing about anybody. There's not anything here about Mary. Some of you know Psalm 2. Do you remember how Psalm 2 ends? What does it say? Kiss the Son. Right? Kiss the Son lest He be angry and you perish in the way for His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. How about John 3.18? Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. Whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. If you're condemned, it's because you don't believe in the Son. You have to believe in the Son. No one else. You have to believe in the Son. How about these three? Very often quoted together. John 5.23 Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. You can't think you honor God if you don't honor the Son. You can't think you honor God if you're trying to get to God by some way other than by the Son. John 15.23 is similar. Whoever hates Me hates My Father also. And if you're not for Christ, you hate Him. If you're trying to get to the Father by another way, you hate Christ. You reject Christ. 1 John 2.23 No one who denies the Son has the Father. If you're trying to get to the Father any way besides the Son, if you deny the Son, you don't have the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. I mean, it, Scripture is exclusive to the hilt. It, it, it makes for no exceptions and it makes for no second way and for no rival Right, I considered Romans 10. Which one do you have in mind exactly? That's exclusive. Yes. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. Yeah, that I, I I looked at that, but I didn't take it because it doesn't specifically say that that's the only way. There's lots of generic and general text. I wanted to pull out the ones that show they, they make for no space for anyone else. There's no other Savior. There's no other way. There's, not a, there's it, it, nothing about sincerity in another religion. John 3.36 is one I looked at as well. Yeah. Go ahead and quote that. Right. If you don't obey the Son, you don't have life. That's over. That's opposite of believing in Him. So, okay. <clears throat> but why should we be persuaded that Jesus tells us He's the only way? And I, th I, <clears throat> I think this is a, something that Jesus Himself thought it good to deal with. Islam denies that He's the only way. Look, Catholicism denies He's the only way. They're wanting to exalt Mary all the time is uh, they're, they're wanting to crush Christ as the only... They, you've heard, they, Pope John Paul II wanted to declare Mary as what? Co-mediatrix. There is one mediator we looked at already. 1 Timothy 2.5 One mediator between God and man. They want to make her a mediatrix. False religions, they, they deny. Hinduism denies it. And this, even the relativism of today, look, you can't say, well, Jesus is right for you, but not for me. That's a total denial of it. As though there's a right way for you and there's 
There's another right way for me. That's, that's a kind of... I've heard people who have said, Christ can't be the only way. If that's true, look how many people are going to hell. Well, exactly. I mean, it's, it's scary if you only took those people in this world that profess to be Christians, how many people are missing heaven. A lot. How many, how many Muslims are in the world? Over a billion. And you know what? We would say to Muslims, Christ is your only hope. If you stay on that path, if you continue to reject Christ, there is nothing. We cannot offer anybody aside from Christ any hope of finding entrance to God. There is none. Jesus says that if you reject Him, you reject the Father. You reject God if you reject Christ. There is no way to God by any other way. It's true. It's true. Many will miss heaven. And that's, that's just at taking professing Christians at face value. And we, you know, we could start trimming that away and by the time you're done, it's, you have the truth that Jesus said, right? Few there be that find it. So why should we be persuaded that Jesus is the only way? And, and I know of no better way than to try to convince you in the way that Jesus did. And the, the place I find this most systematically presented is in John 5. T turn in John 5. I want you to see how Jesus reasoned with those who were refusing Him. What Jesus does is it's, it's as though He takes us into a courtroom and He says, I have six witnesses that I want to bring to the stand that are going to bear testimony that I am the Messiah. That I am the Savior of the world. Six witnesses. So let's jump in in verse 31. John 5.31 Jesus says this, If I alone bear witness about Myself... Now, stop right there. If, if I alone bear witness to Myself, or about Myself, my testimony is not true. But it, in what he's saying, you can tell what? Who is the first witness to Christ being who he says he is? Well, himself. Right? He says, if I alone bear witness, his witness isn't valid because in Scripture you needed how many witnesses for a testimony to be valid? Two or three, more than one. And he said, if I alone bear witness, but you have to see in that he is bearing witness. He's just saying, if I alone bear it, it's not valid, but I am bearing it, but not by myself. Where does Jesus bear witness to the fact he is the Messiah? The lady, woman at the well, John 4. Where does He bear witness to the fact that He is the way, the truth, and the life and that there is no way to the Father except through Him? John 14. Where does He say, I am the door? John 10. Did Jesus bear witness to Himself that He is the only way to God? That He is the Messiah? The One that was... Being waited for, the woman at the well there was saying, you know, we expect when He comes. And He says, the one you're talking to is He. 
Did Jesus bear witness to himself? You better believe he did. But he says this, If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me. And I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. Who's that? That's the Father. And you see it very plainly. Look down in 37. In verse 37, the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. In what way? I mean, where would be a place where the Father clearly bears witness to the Son? At the baptism, what did the Father say? This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. The Father bore witness. Well, let's, let's keep reading. Verse 33, You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. So you got John the Baptist. What did John the Baptist say? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What else did he say? What did he say in the synoptics? He said there was one coming after him, right? He said he baptized with water, but there was one coming after him, sandals. He's not worthy to touch them. He said he was going to baptize them with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Jesus was testified to by John. Now let's keep reading. Verse 34, Not that the testimony I receive is from man. Oh, this is huge. Watch these next words. I, I'm floored by these words. But I say these things so that you may be saved. It's like Jesus wants to bring every witness possible to the stand. Why? Because He wants them to be saved. He brings up these witnesses, even John the Baptist, a witness he doesn't need to say, I want you to hear John's witness because I want to convince you I am He. Aren't you, aren't you floored by that? I mean, you know what this shows me? One thing it shows me amazingly is how much God uses means. Jesus could have said, I'm the Son of God. I'm the Word of God. I'm the Mighty God. I can snap my fingers and make people believe. But He says, I say these things to you so that you might believe. You see how important it is that we convince men of the truth? Even Jesus, He's saying, I am reasoning with you. Isn't that what God says in Scripture? Come, let us reason together. Oh, if, if, you, if the radiance of the glory of God can't be seen here, Christ, that exact image of His Father, coming into this world and seeking to reason with sinners. So, Christ bears witness. The Father bears witness. John bears witness. But let's keep reading. Verse 35, He was a burning and shining lamp you were willing to rejoice for a while in His light. Verse 36, But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given Me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing bear witness about Me that the Father has sent Me. Christ's works bear witness. Did you ever hear 
where Jesus said, why, why are you all reasoning that way in your minds? Let me ask you a question. Which is easier? To say to this man, rise up and walk, or to say your sins are forgiven you, but that you might know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. He says, rise up and walk. Jesus' works testify that this is the one who forgives sin. His works, He kept saying, if you, if you don't believe Me because I say it, believe Me because of My works. Nobody ever did what Jesus did. Nobody ever raised as many people from the dead. Nobody ever cured as many people that were sick. Nobody ever walked into crowds and healed everybody over and over and over and over again. He's saying, look, my works bear testimony that I am unlike anybody else that has ever come. And even when you come... Look, even where it says that we will do the same works that He did and greater works than these, it doesn't mean the kind of healing that He did. I believe that that has to do with the ingathering of souls. I don't, there's, because it's just not true. Nobody has ever come along before Him or after Him that did the amount of works that He did of, of compassion to mankind, delivering them from demons, feeding them. Who calms storms? Who walked on water except Peter at the bidding of Christ? Nobody did works like His. Nobody. Nobody spoke words like He spoke. You see that. Time and again, people, they would hear Him and and He would would leave His enemies stymied. Those that came to take Him couldn't take Him because His words just befuddled them. People just sat at His feet like Mary, just amazed. They didn't want to go anywhere else. Nobody ever spoke wisdom like this one spoke. Solomon could not have held a candle to Christ. And so there are his works. Well, let's keep reading, though. The witnesses aren't done. He says in verse 37 And the Father who has sent me has Himself borne witness about Me. We've already dealt with the Father, His voice. You have never heard His form. You have never seen. And you do not have His Word abiding in you, for you do not believe the One whom He has sent. Here's the fifth witness. You search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about Me. Christ is witness. The Father is witness. John the Baptist is witness. Christ's works bear witness. And the Scriptures bear witness. Give me some Old Testament Scripture that bears witness to the fact that this is the Savior. I mean, what's probably the most glorious? The most obvious? The virgin birth. Isaiah 53. I mean, does anybody know the exact number of prophecies that were fulfilled in Christ? What's the number, Kevin? It's hundreds. I don't know the exact number. It's hundreds. Psalm Psalm 22 is glorious. Isaiah 53 is glorious. Isaiah 9. I mean, it just goes on. Um, Scripture repeatedly bears witness. Let's, Let's try this. Where is he in 
the Psalms. We heard Psalm 22. Where else is he? Psalm 110 is the most oft quoted psalm in the New Testament. Speaks of Christ. What does it say, brother? The Lord has said to my Lord. How about Psalm 95? Can you think of anything there? How about Proverbs? Where do we see Him in the Proverbs? Wisdom. How about about Proverbs 8? Wisdom. You see wisdom personified and rejoicing before God. How about in the Song of Solomon? Where is he in the Song of Solomon? The bridegroom. Anyways, he's he's throughout Scripture. But we have one more witness here. He says that... Verse 39, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about Me. Yet you refuse to come to Me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I've come in My Father's name, and you do not receive Me. You talk about another exclusive text. You don't have the love of God in you if you don't receive Christ. That's pretty exclusive. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if, now watch this, if you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. If you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? There's the sixth witness. Moses. Now, I know that's kind of overlaps with the fifth one, Scripture. But that's what Jesus says, I bear witness, I tell you, I am the Christ. I mean, when the high priest adjured him by the living God, he, he said so. He said who he was. And they said, well, you know, we don't need any other testimony. We've heard it with our own ears. It's either blasphemy or He is who He says He is. He's either a liar or He's not. And He would say, I'm not, I'm not the only witness here. My Father is born witness. And in fact, there's more witnesses. My works are a witness. John is a witness. Scripture is a witness. Moses is a witness. How did Moses bear witness of Him? Can anybody remember? Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Think of the first five books. What are the first five books? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Tell me in Genesis where you find Christ. Where? 315. Right at the start of the Bible. What does it say? What does it call Christ there? The son of the woman. And he's going to do what? Crush the head of the serpent. Where do we find Christ in Exodus? The Passover lamb? Where else? The rock. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 10 says that's Christ out there in the wilderness. The manna. How about Leviticus? I mean, that's all about the sacrifices. That's all about the high priesthood. That's all about the festivals. They're all shadows. And we find over in Colossians chapter 2, They all point to Christ. 
How about Numbers? Somebody read Numbers 24-17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Sheph. A star and a scepter. There's Christ. How about in Deuteronomy? Somebody read Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 19. Is this not Moses himself prophesying from his own lips, not just off his own pen? What does he say? The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is him you shall listen. <laughs> Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see his great fire and more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command. And whoever will not listen to my words, that... He shall speak in my name. I myself will require it of him. Hebrews chapter 1, you see that in those former days He spoke by the prophets, but in these last days He's spoken by way of a Son. Who is it in the New Testament that tells us about those words and that this is fulfilled in Christ? Peter. Who else? Does Stephen? I think he does. So there are your witnesses. Now, here's the thing. Okay, so remember the question. How do you know that Christ is the only way? Why should I consider becoming a Christian? Well, What we have are these witnesses. Christ bears witness. The Father bears witness. John bears witness. Christ works bear witness. Scripture bears witness. Moses bears witness. Somebody may come along and say, but in the end, all those witnesses are really spoken of in the one witness that is Scripture. But what if I deny Scripture altogether? Prove to me outside of Scripture that Jesus Christ is the only way. Prove to me outside of Scripture that I should consider becoming a Christian. How do you answer that? Because there's people that will say that, right? I mean, we, you just go through this whole thing and you say, hey, I find over and over and over and over again, Scripture bears witness to the fact that Jesus is proclaimed as the exclusive Savior. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is none other. No man comes unto the Father except through Him. It's exclusive. He is the door. But you say, all these witnesses, it's Scripture that says to us, that the Father is a witness. It's Scripture that says Christ is His own witness. It's Scripture that says that John bears witness. It's Scripture that says Scripture bears witness. It's Scripture that says Christ works bear witness. It's Scripture that proclaim Christ works. It's Scripture that tells us what Moses says. What if in the end Scripture isn't true? Convince me outside of that. What do we answer? What's that? Information. But does, does, does creation... Creation definitely testifies to something. But what does Scripture say that it testifies to? What are the two things in Romans 1 that it says it testifies to? Eternal power and divine nature. 
It, doesn't ne- it, it definitely tells men enough that they're inexcusable. But it doesn't tell us that Christ is the only way. Is there another way? Yeah, but how do you know the resurrection except from the Scriptures? Prove the resurrection to me outside the Scriptures. Look, just because somebody wants you to do something doesn't mean that you need to do that. Just because somebody wants you to make a case other than with witnesses outside of the realm of the witnesses God has given us, don't go there. Because because here's the thing. This is what I would say to somebody. You know most of the people that will shoot down Scripture have never read it. Now there are those that have. There are those that have. There are those that they grew up in the church, they read their Bible, there are those that have. But 99% of the people have not read it. And look, I'll tell you this. In false religions, they do not want you taking the literature or reading. I I mean, they they would highly frown on you. Have you ever had Jehovah's Witnesses? You've tried to give them something? They don't want to take it. Why not? Look, Scripture speaks about demon doctrines. The devil is behind false religion. Do you know what truth the devil knows a lot better than we do? Men are born again through the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. That the Gospel is the power of God unto salvation. I'll tell you what, the devil doesn't want people reading the Bible. But here's the thing. What we would say to anybody is listen, you you can say what if Scripture isn't true. But I'll tell you this, people who did not believe in Jesus Christ at first oftentimes went to hear Him and they came away saying, that's the Christ. There were people who went to hear Him and said, nobody ever spoke like Him. Nathaniel heard Him and said, ooh, that's Him. People saw His works There are people that saw His works and heard His words and they said, that's the Christ. That woman at the well, she ran into the city there. She said, is this not the Christ? You need to listen to Him. You need to listen to the witness of Scripture before you reject it. Because one thing I found, nobody made up this Christ. No man dreamt up. If you read the Koran, if you read the Book of Mormon, it sounds a whole lot like the Apocrypha. It sounds man-made. Because there's a way that man communicates things. There's a way man says things. There's a way man invents things. There's a way man makes up fairy tales. And... This book does not sound like that. This book, look, the very wisdom that floored people is still here in this book. I mean, when still when you read, if you can remember back to like the first time you read and they came to him and they were trying to trap him. Okay, we got him because we're going to ask him about paying taxes and and we've got him because no way he answers here is he going to be able to wiggle out of this thing. And he answered in a way that just blew them all away. I mean, these guys, they, were, they walked away like drunken sailors from talking to him. Like they were these, these were the elite minds. These were the lawyers, the scribes, the Pharisees. They knew the law. The, these were the teachers in Israel. And time and again, they went away like they were a bunch of little kids. They just, he just blew them away. And it's not like we just hear that He blew them away. We actually have the words He blew them away with and when we read them, they blow us away. Nobody created the Christ in this book. The devil doesn't want people going to this book. Look, I can tell you this. 
truth. Truth can handle examination. Those, those who have systems of error, they want to keep their people from the truth. Jehovah's Witnesses do not want their people taking our stuff. They don't want them taking those DVDs that proclaim that Gospel so plainly. They don't want that. They want to keep, they want to keep them away. Keep them away from truth. Keep them away from what's right. They don't want them to be exposed. Matt Haney said that, that he heard that today in the Jewish synagogues, maybe some of you heard this, I've said this before after he said it, in many of the synagogues today, Jewish synagogues, what will they not let be read? Isaiah 53. You know why? Because when they read it, people get saved and they lose them. Scripture handles examination. Truth will handle examination. If somebody wants to say, I want other witnesses, say, I don't have other witnesses. But before you reject this witness and the six witnesses it testifies to, read it before you reject it. Because Jesus, there in John 5, said this, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. You know what happens when the dead go to this and start reading? They hear the voice of the Son of God and they live. So you send them there. Examine the Scriptures to see if these things are so. So, how do you know that Christ is the only way? Let me just end being subjective. I went to this Word and I had such revelations of Christ and of my own sin. It turned my life upside down. God regenerated me through this. My life is totally different than it used to be. He transformed me, changed my desires, caused me to fall in love with Christ. He, he, the old man that I used to be is gone. There's a new man in its place. I went to this book and I believed on the Christ in it and God brought peace to my soul. I mean, then Christians can say that. And so somebody can come along to us and say, that's not true. Well, Scripture bears witness to itself. But my own experience, which is definitely beneath this, but my own experience bears witness that what this book says is true. And it proclaims a Christ that answered to my needs perfectly. And my need was, I saw myself a hell-bound sinner with no escape, and I knew justice was closing in on me. And when I saw Christ paid the ransom price, and He obeyed the law in my place, there was salvation to be found. And like it says, if, if you call upon Him, you'll be saved. I called upon Him and I was saved. And where I was guilty and under conviction as this vile sinner suddenly flooded my soul, with the peace and joy of the forgiveness that this book testifies to. How do you know that Christ is the only way? Why should I be consider becoming a Christian? Well, that's how we know. And the reason you should consider it is because you're a sinner and life is short. And death is going to take you and there is a judgment day. 
And God provided a, sin, a Savior for sinners. He didn't do that to the fallen angels. We're sinners and He's provided a way of escape. He's provided a Passover lamb. He's provided a city of refuge. He's provided the manna, the bread of God, that if we eat, we'll live. He's provided the Savior to perfectly answer to the needs of fallen man. That's why you want to become a Christian. Because there's eternal life. There's joy forevermore. There's the riches of Christ. There's an inheritance. There's heaven to be had. It's called paradise. It's a place where blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. They'll be with God. They'll enjoy God. They'll walk with God. They'll be the bride of Christ. They'll be clothed in splendor. They'll walk with their God and have death taken away and every tear wiped away and forever and forever and through all ages. They'll know just the endless bliss and eternal joy. That's why you want to become a Christian. If you don't, you lose your soul. If you don't, you pay the penalty, just penalty for your sins. That penalty, it's perfectly fair. It's perfectly in accord with the depth of the guilt that we have, but we don't recognize how bad it is. It's bad. It requires an eternal punishment in hell. You want to become a Christian because you want to escape that. Jesus said that people that go there would be better if they were never born. He calls it a place of weeping, a place of gnashing of teeth, a place where the worm never dies, a place of outer darkness. He says it's a place to be escaped at all costs. That's why you want to become a Christian. Because you have a never dying soul. And there is a judgment day coming. And the crimes you've committed will not be pardoned any other way. That's why you want to become a Christian. Well, that's my best attempt to answer that. Father, we thank You for the witnesses. We thank You for the Word. We thank You that You've put Your witness into this world. We know that the day is upon us when the dead do hear. We were those dead once. Many of us in this place, we were the dead and Christ spoke and we heard. We thank You for Your mercy. We thank You, Lord. We thank You. In Christ's name, Amen.